into that. As I said, as I was saying before, it's a question of, uh, it's an, one of those key historical moments, okay? Things happen in about 15, 20 years in that period that change completely the history of the Western world, if not the history of all humanity. And I'm not exaggerating. Okay, the question, and one of the key questions in this moment is uh, the, the fact of uh, the Lutheran and uh, the Protestant Reformation. That is a key question. And then the English Reformation and uh, the English complete change from uh, by Henry VIII. That, you know, it's, as I said, it's one of those key moments in the history of humanity where where so many things change that you begin to wonder, Jesus, what happened here? But a lot of, a lot of things really, really, really change. Okay, but anyway, um, I, I prepared my, uh, my lesson, <laughs> okay? I prepared my lesson first to sort of give you the historical background, okay? And uh, of the whole thing. Now, as you know, a lot of you have heard of the War of the Roses. At the end of the War of the Roses, one of the families that emerges from the War of the Roses is the Tudor family. And Henry the Seventh, Henry the Seventh, becomes King of England, okay? For from a period of 20, 30 years without a king and without a leader in England, we have Henry VII, and he becomes king. Henry VII has two children. One is a person that you really don't know, and he was his first child was Arthur. He was the prince who was going to inherit the throne. The second in line of heredity was Henry. The question is that, you know, as it often happens with families, um, what happened is that at this point, Spain and England, always for political reason, they want to unite, they want to ally and become and create a stronger alliance between the two countries. And you know, in Europe, whenever you try to ally one country with another country, what happens is that you're always doing it against somebody else. Okay? And at this time, obviously, their uh, liaison was mainly to go against uh, France. And so what happens is that they decided to for King, for Prince Arthur to marry a Spanish princess, in other words, marry Catherine. Okay? The question is that, uh, and the problem mainly, was that uh, the prince died. He was married, and as you know, they married by proxy, okay, before they even saw each other, they were married. So Prince uh, Arthur and uh, Princess Catherine were legally married, okay, but they had never seen each other before. And what happened is that the marriage was never consummated, but they were married. And uh, Prince Arthur died before this happened, okay, before they consummated the marriage and before, obviously, he became king. Now, um, so Catherine became a widow Okay, before she became a bride, <laughs> she was a widow already. So what happened is that the two countries, Spain and England, decided that they wanted to keep okay, this uh, um, liaison together, and obviously, what did they do? They decided that Henry, the second born, and now heir to the throne, was going to marry Catherine. Now, according to Christian law, and according to religious law, what happened was that a man, a man cannot marry his brother's widow, okay? He could not marry Catherine, so what did they do? The two countries obviously went to the Pope and they said, okay, well, you know, um, we need a dispensation, you know, so that uh, Prince Henry can marry Catherine, Princess Catherine, 
And the, prayer, the Pope said, well, well, no problem, you know, all you have to do is ask and I will give you the dispensation. And in fact, he, he was dispensing and uh, Henry, Henry uh, married Catherine. Now, they, they lived together, it's not a problem. And uh, Catherine was a very religious woman. She became a very religious woman. And from their union, from their union, there came a princess, Princess Mary who later became Queen Mary, also called Bloody Mary. <laughs> and uh, eventually, what happened was that the, this doesn't mean that the king uh, didn't enjoy himself uh, in other enterprises, in other relationships, you know. Uh, he did have other relationships with other women. In fact, he also had children with other women. Okay? But they were not his wife. Okay? And not being his wife, they could not inherit the throne. They could become dukes, they could become counts, and in fact some of his children, illegitimate, illegitimate children, became dukes and counts. Okay? He made them dukes and counts, but he wanted a male heir to the throne. Why? Because he was the second, the second Tudor king, and just a few years before, they had had a long civil war in England, and he felt that a woman, a woman, could not keep the realm together. So he needed a male heir. He needed a king, and this was the main reason for wanting a divorce eventually from Catherine. Later, obviously, what happened was that uh, he fell in love with Anne Boleyn, and uh, he also had, a, he had a, a very long relationship with his sister, okay, with Anne's sister Mary, and he, with her he had two children, okay, uh, but he left Mary and went with Anne. Anne was a little a little more clever than Mary. Why? Because she would not go to bed with him until they married. Okay? And uh, so eventually they decided uh, they decided that uh, they will they would get married and they would have a male heir, a son with the new marriage. The problem was that at that particular time uh, um, the king, but remember that the king was a very devoted Christian. He was, he was not really, I'm not exaggerating, and, and, not, and not superficially, he was really a great devoted Christian. Okay? In fact, he was no, named defender of the faith by the Pope himself. This was in 1521. So he was a, truly a Christian. But the question is that later he felt and he came to believe that because he had married his, his brother's wife and his brother's widow, that was automatically, automatically a sin, and he lived in sin. And this was the reason why he didn't have a male heir. So, in order to have a male heir, what did he have to do? He had to first get a divorce, marry somebody else, and get a male heir. Okay? And not live in sin any longer. So this was the problem that brought the whole situation to a dramatic moment, to a dramatic point. And this is far as the background, okay? When Henry asked Rome for a divorce, what happened is that at that particular time, Rome was sacked by the Spaniards. Okay? Uh, in other words, Rome was invaded and sacked completely. People died, and people were killed, the people were um, butchered. And I'm not exaggerating. When I say butchered, I mean butchered. Okay? Uh, do, do you know what I mean by butchered? Machelati. Okay? People were literally, as I said, I'm not exaggerating, they were butchered in the streets. 
pregnant women were open uh, completely. Men were open and disemboweled. Okay? Uh, this, this is what happened in Rome, what was happening in Rome at that particular time. Okay? By Spanish troops. So obviously, obviously the Pope was submitted politically, okay, by the Spanish king. So when Henry asked him for a divorce from a Spanish princess, what could the Pope say? No, I'm sorry, I can't. Okay? And there were, and there were a lot of studies by many English universities about the origin of the papacy and the, the true and honest power of the Pope. And the, a lot of the students from Cambridge and from Oxford, in fact, understood and decided that the Pope was just another bishop like anybody else. And so Henry said, okay, well, if he is just another bishop and he is not the vicar of God and the vicar of Jesus Christ on earth, if he is just another simple bishop like is anybody else, fine, no problem. I can nominate the bishops and the bishop can give me a divorce. And this is exactly what he does. Okay? He nominates a bishop, the Bishop of Canterbury, and the Bishop of Canterbury gives him a divorce. And he marries Anne. So this is the historical background, okay, that I wanted to give you. Now, let's begin with uh, more, okay? And the problem, our important point is more himself. First, now, Moore was born in London in 1478. He studied at Oxford and became, like his father, a lawyer. Okay, just a simple lawyer. Now he came from a middle class family. He didn't come from a noble family. In 1497, he met Erasmus of uh, Rotterdam, who introduced him to humanism. He was uh, employed on numerous embassies abroad, particularly in the Netherlands and France. Now, at that time, there were ambassadors moving to different countries and they had to negotiate, uh, uh, negotiate uh, trade agreements, any kind of commercial agreement with other countries, and particularly, for example, with Netherlands and with uh, the Flemish and Netherlands in general, the Low Countries, where they worked, they worked English wool a lot, and they worked cloth, and they, so there was a lot of exchange between England and the Netherlands, with France as well. And the most important person negotiator uh, for these commercial treaties, for these commercial contracts, was and became uh, more. He was the negotiator of the team. So he became an extremely important person inside the monarchy and inside all of the, the country. So, and in 1529, he succeeded Wolsey as Lord Chancellor. Now, another thing, Lord Chancellor, okay, what you consider today Il Cancelliere dello Scacchiere, the Lord Chancellor at the time was the most important position in England next to the King. Okay? Uh, until that moment, Wolsey, Cardinal Wolsey, was Lord Chancellor. He was uh, dethroned as a Lord Chancellor for a very simple reason because he could not give uh, Henry a divorce. The king was asking for a divorce. Wolsey could not provide him a divorce, so obviously uh, he had to resign uh, the chancellorship. And the next in line, the next person who became uh, uh, chancellor was uh, Thomas More, became chancellor of the, the exchequer. Now, he was an extremely learned man. This is one thing that you always have to keep in mind. With uh, and uh, a person who wanted 
to exchange, but a slow ecclesiastical reform. Now, he wanted church reforms, but not from the outside. He wanted church reform from within the church, not from outside the church. And remember what I told you before, this is a very particular moment, okay, because in 1517, again, the Lutheran Reformation, but he accepted, he wanted reformation, but within the church and not uh, outside of uh, the church. He could not accept Henry's as the supreme head of the church. Now, when, when Henry asked for a divorce, and one of his cardinals, one of his bishops, gave him a divorce, at the same time he became head of the church. Not the pope anymore, but he himself, the king, became head of the church. He could nominate bishops, he could change, uh, nominate priests, he could do anything he wanted because he became head of the church. Yeah. Now, in some of his works, perhaps you have learned, you've learned of uh, Thomas More from uh, his most important, most important works. He wrote a lot of pamphlets. Most of the pamphlets that he wrote were against the heretics. And there were a lot of heretics at the time, and he wrote a lot of pamphlets against heretics. Okay? Uh, especially, especially Luther, Luther, Martin Luther, and uh, Zwigli, and uh, other, other, th th there were many, many heretics at the time, and he kept on writing against them. That's the first thing. Second, he wrote a lot of letters, okay? Now, remember, at that time, they didn't have emails, so he could not send emails, so they wrote letters, and they wrote a lot of letters, okay? And he wrote a lot of letters as well especially to his very, very good friend, Erasmus, Erasmus of Rotterdam. There was a great relationship uh, between the two. And they became very, very, very good friends, very good friends. But what we know him very well, or best from, is his great work, which is called Utopia. Okay, and I'm sure you have probably heard of uh, Utopia. And what is it about? Okay, uh, however, he is usually remembered as, uh, as another of Utopia, which was published now. Utopia was published in 1516 and later translated into English. It was now, remember, at that time, most of the works were all written in Latin and not in English, okay? Especially, especially treaties, all written in Latin. For example, philosophical treaties, uh, religious, ecclesiastical treaties, the common language was Latin. And so he wrote in Latin. It was translated in English in about 1555. Uh, it, be, it was translated in English at the time. Now, the work Utopia. What is it about? Okay, the work is in the form of a dialogue between the author and an imaginary traveler who had visited many lands. So we have this traveler who asks questions, and he answers the question. So we have a dialogue between the narrator and the traveler, and basically this is what Utopia is based on. This is how the structure of Utopia. Um, now, a lot of you who have studied uh, philosophies, you have studied uh, Plato's Republic. Okay? Plato's Republic is based more or less exactly in the same way. Okay? It's, it's a dialogue. Okay? It's a dialogue that happens and so he based his Utopia more or less uh, along the same kind of structure. Okay. So, it is divided into two parts. The first describes England socially and economically as it was during Moore's time. It is basically a picture of corruption, misuse of private property, and the proceedings of nobles who convert their land to pastures, creating unemployment, poverty, and total dismember of the social network. Now, what do I mean? 
I mean a very simple thing. The landlord at the time, they discovered one very simple thing. That instead of uh, working the land and having crops, what did they do? They decided to turn the land into pastures. In other words, have sheep. Why? Because with sheep, they made more money. Okay? But what happens is that at the same time, you are destroying the social and economic network of the whole community. The people who work on the land, the farmers, okay, are going to lose their jobs. And that means families dismembered. That means the destruction of the social network that they had. Okay? So this is what he means when he says that the nobles were responsible for this corruption and dismemberment of society. Then the second part, the second part of uh, Utopia, on the other hand, describes the imaginary island of Utopia where private property had disappeared and there is a religious toleration. People only worked six hours a day. The ruler was chosen by the people and many and may be deposed if he becomes a tyrant. War and luxury are hated. All men and women have a right to education. Hunting was abolished. The laws are clear and easy to understand. He practically anticipates a democratic system. Okay? The total destruction of private property. Marxism. Okay? This is what he anticipates. This is what he foresees in his utopia. Education of all people, men and women. An example, perfect example is this. For example, his daughter Margaret. She had a reputation for being the most intelligent woman in England. Not in London. The most intelligent woman in England, his daughter Margaret. This is to tell you how, how much he considered education and the importance of education, not only for men, but for women as well. On a close look, okay, um, trying to oversimplify things because uh, we don't have the time, the structure of the work could be seen as a mixture of Plato's Republic and St. Augustine's God, City of God. A mixture of these two we could see. He describes the social and economic evils of his time and then he proposes solutions which seemed miraculous for his time. But now, all of the solutions that he foresaw are reality, except for private property. But all of the others are real, so they are not so miraculous. His faith, now, uh, the solution that proposes obviously don't take into account man's numerous and profound faults and that is greed, avarice, corruption, the thirst for power, lust, hate, all of these vices of man he doesn't take into consideration, okay? Now his faith in reason uh, and remember, he becomes, he is the first humanist in the English uh, Renaissance. His faith in reason and the material goodness of man anticipates the enlightenment. And, some, and in some ways, as I was saying before, uh, Marxism itself is anticipated by the work. Communal, communal property, for example, the lack of private enterprise make him and his work an extremely modern, but at the same time modern but Christian, okay? Uh, not only modern because he eliminates religion, he doesn't. 
because religion and Christianity is at the basis of his uh, thought. And as I said, we can see this uh, uh, when we, as I mentioned before, in the city of God of St. Augustine, which is the same thing. However, now this, this is basically a background thing. However, today, today, I would like not to talk about uh, forms uh, uh, on the author. I don't want to talk about utopia, and I don't want to talk about the author of utopia. Um, I don't want to talk about the philosopher or the lawyer or the humanist or the ambassador, as we saw before. I would like to show you and uh, tell you about a tragic event which brought the political, uh, the economic, and the personal downfall of a very simple man. In other words, I want to show you the man, okay, and not the philosopher or uh, the ambassador, uh, the negotiator, uh, the great humanist, the writer. That's that's, you know. We don't have time for that, but what I would like to show you is more the person himself. Thomas was a man with a clear and determined sense of his own self. In other words, he understood himself very well. He knew himself, okay? He knew well when to speak and when to be quiet, what to say and what not to say at all times. His good points and his bad points, what he could reveal and what he could not be revealed from his most profound. He was aware of his selfhood. Today, we would say that he is a person who knows himself and controls all of his basic instincts from selfishness to arrogance. He was not a senseless and unthinking hero. Now, this is one thing that he did not want to be a hero. He wasn't a hero. He didn't want to be a hero. The circumstances forced him uh, to become a hero, but he, that, that's the least he wanted to be. But not because of religion. Not because he was a, a, a profound Christian. But simply because he, it was not in him to be a hero. He didn't want to be a hero. He had a great sense of fear and dread of himself and what his personal decisions could mean for him and the people around him, from his beloved daughter Margaret to the last of his servants. In other words, when he spoke, when he decided something, the people around him were his most important things. In other words, his decisions were based on how his decision could influence the people around him. If they hurt, if his decisions would hurt the people around him, he would try not to take that decision. Okay, this is for the great love he had for his family and for the people that worked for him. It may be strange to you, but really, he treated his servants and at a certain point, he had a lot of servants. He became an extremely rich man, very, very rich man. He treated his servants the same as he would treat the rest of his family. There was no difference, you see. Since he was an extremely clever, a clever man, and of course a lawyer, now you know lawyers can get out of anything, if a good lawyer, and he was an excellent lawyer, he could easily find his way out of any critical moment or legal traps. And believe me, they set a lot of legal traps for him. Not one, but numerous. Until he is faced with one overwhelming question. And what is this overwhelming question? The great question of his life was, uh, uh, integrity and selfhood. Integrity, in other words, will my decisions hinder, in other words, 
um, damage my personal integrity, what I represent, who I am, this is exactly what he does. And this is exactly the truth.